Hi, it's time for another installment in the Op Amp tutorial series. Today we're going to take a look at composite amplifiers. And you may not have heard of these before because your regular textbooks pretty much don't mention composite amplifiers at all. But in the real world, when you have to meet system design application goals, you can bet that one day you might have to use a composite amplifier. So anyway, I'll link in uh, all my uh, tutorial series down below for op amps. So this one uh, kind of follows on from the uh, multi-stage compound amplifier we looked at in uh, the previous video, where we uh, cascaded multiple uh, amplifiers in series to give us increased system bandwidth and you can do this with composite amplifiers too but composite amplifiers have a huge number of other benefits we're going to look at. So in that previous video we looked at a multi-stage amplifier also known as a compound amplifier because the amplifiers the gain of each stage is compounded together to give you a total system gain like this one could be uh, times 10 I've drawn it as a buffer here just for simplicity but it could be a times 10 amplifier this one's times 10 gives you a total uh, gain of times 100 but uh, you get extra bandwidth because you've split the gain of times 10 here and times 10 here so that's just a little way to increase your system bandwidth so let's take the simple example of two buffer amplifiers in series here in this multi-stage compound uh, configuration of course uh, this is just acting as a buffer this one's acting as a buffer here now why would you do that in this particular case well at the end of this video hang around we'll do a practical breadboard uh, example of kind of what we're looking at here in the real world in practical applications you often have multiple system design requirements for your amplifier and some of them can include you know input impedance you might need really high input impedance you might need ultra low uh, input offset voltage really DC precision stuff you might need a huge bandwidth you might need a huge output drive capability driving ultra low impedance loads or driving high capacitive loads uh, you might need really low drift with uh, temperature for example you might need ultra low noise and okay good luck trying to find that perfect amplifier even though you can get thousands of amplifiers from your local uh, component supplier good luck finding like one that does all these things because you can't there's no such thing as often as a perfect amplifier in practice and this is where composite amplifiers come into play composite amplifiers allow you to actually design your circuit so that you can use the best and you can pick and choose the best uh, specifications of different types of op amps and combine them together into one composite amplifier it's really cool so how does a composite amplifier work? Well, it's really simple. In the multi-stage one we had here, the output, we've got its own little feedback loop here, and the output drives the input of the second stage amplifier. It's got its own little feedback loop here. It's unity gain here, but of course you can have your uh, gain resistors in there. You can have your compensation networks and all sorts of things. So they're two separate amplifiers, and they don't really interact with each other at all, except from like a load point of view. That's it. But a composite amplifier, you actually join these two together so that they're joined at the hip and you get the best of both worlds. So to turn our simple example of two buffer amplifiers here into a composite amplifier, we just break the feedback path here and instead of taking it from the output of that, we take it from the output of the second amplifier here. So the second amplifier, we'll call A2, is included in the feedback loop for A1 and when you do this it's incredibly powerful because you might choose amplifier A1 because it's an ultra low uh, offset voltage DC precision amplifier for example you know it's got 0.1 microvolts offset voltage in it but you might want to drive a big load with that thing and <laughs> go and look up any ultra low uh, offset uh, op, you know chopper stabilized operational amplifier and you'll find that well they can't drive any load at all really so you include this buffer amplifier in the feedback path here so that the sensing is taken Taken from the output so what you're doing here is if you've got an ultra low offset voltage on the input to here then what it's going to do is give you that ultra low offset voltage on the output here instead of here but you get the drive capability of amplifier A2, which might be a huge, like, grunty output buffer that can drive hundreds of milliamps or amps. So you can drive amps of current into your output, 
but you have the benefit of the ultra low input offset voltage or the ultra low noise or whatever it is of this input stage and your output stage here combined you get the best of both of the specs of these two different amplifiers now you might be asking Dave well why can't we just connect that to there like this and just uh, like we've got the input offset voltage and we just use the buffer well go check out the spec of any buffer amplifier like this any high output drive capability and you'll find they've got a terrible offset voltage tens of millivolts so what you're doing is effectively adding like an extra you know 10 millivolts or whatever into there so you've got your nice precision uh, amplifier like this sure this point here the output of this amplifier might be you know 0.1 microvolts for example but then you've added this 10 the horrible offset of this so your output here is 10 millivolts you've just destroyed it right you've just destroyed the advantage of using the ultra low offset here you may as well not even bothered but if you connect that from there to there like this your output then becomes 0.1 not millivolts but microvolts and you've gotten rid of essentially gotten rid of that offset voltage there but you haven't really gotten rid of that offset voltage in this horrible buffer amplifier here it's just that because you're in a total composite loop configuration like this if this amplifier here has 10 millivolts uh, offset voltage on the input then the output of this amplifier will actually drive it at minus 10 millivolts to compensate for the offset the horrible offset voltage of this and it'll do it automatically because it's sensing the output voltage here so it knows how much to add the operational amplifier due to op amp action knows that i know i need to add 10 millivolts here to keep the input offset voltage here the same because you remember your basic op amp rules no these input voltages are the same so your ultra precision 0.1 microvolts input offset here is essentially transferred to the output of this horrible otherwise horrible amplifier here but you get the benefit of this one doing whatever driving capability you need oh and by the way this uh, doesn't need to be an op amp on the input here you might have seen uh, my uh, teardowns of oscilloscopes for example reverse engineering and oscilloscope front end you might find that they use JFETs on the input for like high impedance uh, high bandwidth uh, capabilities they're actually discrete transistors in there instead of uh, op amps but it's still a valid composite amplifier it ha doesn't have to involve op amps all of this can be discrete transistor stuff it doesn't matter you could have a discrete uh, transistor like uh, driver output just like you'd have in say your home hi-fi amplifier you know big beefy MOSFETs in there being able to drive you know 4 ohm 2 ohm loads and stuff like that but you might have uh, some nice JFETs on the input here that you know really high impedance low noise everything else and you combine the best of both worlds using a composite amplifier loop so it's not just specific to op amps you can use discrete components for either of these or both so let's add some gain to this circuit on the output uh, driver a2 here i've added r3 and r4 once again non-inverting configuration just to make it easier to look at but this uh, totally applies to the inverting configuration as well and then we've got r1 and r2 set in the composite gain so we have the output say output stage gain I don't know if that's the best terminology for it but let's just call that the A2 output stage gain but the actual gain of the composite amplifier is actually set by R1 and R2 here so if it helps I've actually uh, redrawn this and you can think about it as one big amplifier like this okay with the output stage A A2 that gain stage there inside there with the resistors R3 and R4 and essentially from the composite amplifier point of view the gain is only set by R1 and R2 technically speaking the gain of this output stage doesn't actually impact the gain of the entire amplifier unless you go to really extreme uh, levels but uh, we won't go into details like that the gain is basically set by R1 and R2 here 
I know this is a little bit confusing. You might think that, well, changing the gain in here surely makes a difference. And, well, it does. Say you want a total system gain of 10, which is set by these resistors here. If you actually choose R3 and R4 here to give you a A2 stage gain of uh, 5, for example, but you want a total system composite amplifier gain of uh, 10, if you choose these values to have an A2 output stage gain of say 5 and you want a total system gain of 10, then it basically forces A1 here to have a gain of 2 to give you that total gain of 10. So if this is times 5, this must be times 2. And likewise, if you wanted the gain to be equally shared between these, then you'd have to choose a gain of uh, the square root of 10, which is 3.16. You'd have to uh, set these, choose these resistors to, for 3.16 gain, and then that would force this amplifier here to also have a gain of 3.16. And that would come into play when you're talking about, say, a uh, gain bandwidth uh, product as uh, one example of your total composite uh, amplifier to get your most bandwidth possible you might want to split uh, your gains between those two. So composite amplifiers they're rather magical they let you combine the best of different amplifiers be they discrete components or op amps uh, combine you know input impedance offset and bandwidth output drive uh, drift uh, temperature drift and noise and all sorts of things uh, you can combine them together in many different ways and I couldn't possibly cover all the different scenarios here it'd just it'd take me forever but as always there's never a free lunch here okay and there are downsides to composite amplifiers if you don't implement them uh, properly you might find they oscillate or do other uh, weird things one general rule is that this uh, second stage amplifier here must have a gate a greater gain bandwidth product than the first one here otherwise they tend to uh, oscillate and I won't go into the details why uh, that's the case that's a <laughs> subject of another more advanced star uh, video and then likewise for something like noise for example you might have a really low noise very schmick you know one nanovolt per root hertz uh, op amp on the input here and then your output uh, amplifier might be 100 nanovolts uh, per root hertz here and you can depending on the gain of these I won't go into too much detail but you can trade off the gain of both of these stages so that you are actually the entire noise of the composite amplifier is actually lower than the worst case uh, 100 nanovolts per root hertz here so effectively if this one has enough gain for example it can compensate for the noise in the second one but it's all a balancing trade-off and it gets a bit complicated if you want to analyze it but thing to take away from this is that composite amplifiers allow you to do stuff like that with noise and offset and input uh, impedance and, and drive capability and everything Here's another interesting uh, practical example. We excuse the crude of the model, didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. Let's say you wanted a really precision, DC precision, high bandwidth amplifier capable of like driving a coax or something like that. Well, how do you do it? Well, you know, you've picked your buffer amplifier here. Oh, I can drive the coax at one gig, no worries, right? But you look at the specs and it's just got horrible DC precision, right? So what can you do? composite amplifier of course so let's say you needed your one uh, you know standard one meg input impedance here well you can choose your a1 amplifier here to do all the dc precision so you'd select it for you know very ultra low dc offset low drift low noise everything else right so this could handle your dc and low frequency stuff but it's no good it's only going to work i don't know up to a meg or something like that right it's no good for the one gigahertz that you want well you can have a DC path here and an AC path through the AC coupling cap C1. So at the higher frequency stuff, you don't really care about that uh, DC precision stuff. So it simply bypasses uh, your DC precision circuit here. And of course, you've got R1 and R2 to set your total composite amplifier again here because it's feeding back from the output here instead of like feeding from here. So it's a composite amplifier with the best of a really high frequency AC, uh, high bandwidth, high drive capability with DC precision. And of course, you might have to add some compensation stuff in here to make sure everything's hunky dory, but beauty, right? Combines the best of both worlds. Composite amplifiers, brilliant.
So hopefully you're getting the idea that composite amplifiers are a very powerful technique to add into your design toolbox in the real world when you have all different sorts of uh, requirements that you need and you can, just can't find that perfect op amp. I lost count of the number of times, could not find a perfect op amp, op amp for a particular configuration and where uh, just cascading them doesn't really get uh, the job done because, well, let's go to the bench right now and I'll show you a practical uh, circuit where we combine an ultra low offset uh, chopper amplifier with an output buffer and see where it can give us a large drive current output capability with an ultra low input offset voltage whilst also potentially compensating for any uh, particular problems that we have in this output uh, stage here in terms of uh, driving. So we're going to have a really precision high drive circuit. Let's go to the bench. All right, let's test an example circuit here on the breadboard. Now, I've got a Max 4239, which you should recognize uh, from the microcurrent. It's a uh, very low offset voltage uh, chopper amplifier. So only like microvolts of offset in this thing. I've got a uh, non-inverting configuration with a gain of 10 here, and we're gonna feed an input signal to here, and we're feeding the output here into a buff 634, which is a uh, low impedance output driver for driving like heavy loads up to a couple of hundred milliamps because there's no way that the Max 4239 or any regular op amp can drive a low impedance load. In this case, we've got a 47 ohm resistor here. There's no way you can drive it. So we're using this as a buffer amplifier. So I've currently got the circuit configured like this. It's a classic two-stage compound uh, amplifier and the output drives the input of this one and it drives our 47 ohm. So we've got a common circuit ground here and we've got a positive and negative rail. So plus minus 2.5 volt uh, supply here because that's the limitation of our Max uh, 4239. And before you watch the first part of this video, you might have thought, well, what's wrong with that circuit? <laughs> it's going to work a treat. We're gonna, we've got a nice precision low offset amp here and we'll be able to drive this 47 ohm load no problems whatsoever. But uh-huh. Let's take a look at the spec sheet. Here it is, the Buff 634. It can drive up to 250 milliamps, 2000 volts per microsecond. It's a really high bandwidth, no worries, right? It can work down to the voltage that we need, but uh, what don't they tell you on the uh, front page here? They don't tell you the offset voltage. Well, let's go measure it. Because the Max 4239 is a little 6-pin uh, SOT23 here. I've done a second channel video actually soldering this. I'll link that in if you want to actually uh, see it. I've just converted that into a dip uh, form factor. We've got our uh, two gain resistors uh, here. This is just the pull-down resistor on the input here. And we've got our load over here. And our uh, output from our amplifier here goes over to the input and then that drives the 47 ohm load. Right, so let's just probe some signals here. Here's our input uh, voltage. You can see that uh, just over 100 millivolts there. We've got a gain of uh, 11 here because you have to include uh, plus one for the non-inverting uh, configuration. So our output voltage should be Let's wind that up. There you go, is 1.1 volts there. No worries. So that's on the output of our Max 4239. Well, let's go over to our buffer over here. And we can see that is exactly the same. Now watch what happens when I actually connect the load here, because this will become interesting later. You'll notice that it's dropped a bit. That could be the impedance of my battery source here or whatever. But the fact is that we're still getting that output voltage here, right? But it's dropping a little bit on the output. But let's actually disconnect our signal and we're measuring the output of the buff amplifier here. Let's actually turn this up. Look at this. We're at uh, 10 millivolts per division. 10, 20, 30 odd millivolts. And what do you know, if you have a look at the spec sheet here for the buff 634, 30 millivolts offset, typical. Wah, so much for your nice precision circuit that you're trying to do here with your ultra low offset with your Max 4239. You've just ruined it because you've used the compound configuration. And we can actually measure that here with our meter. We'll measure the offset voltage of the Max 4239 here. You'll notice, right, it's not all. Right, it's, it's close to zero. It's like, well, you know, 100 microvolts uh, there. That might be because I don't have a proper star ground in that's capable of better than that. But <laughs> it's like, it is really low, okay? So that's the output here. And the offset voltage of our bus 634 here, 33 millivolts. So we've ruined our beautiful little circuit. But, aha, uh -huh, we can change this 
with one little simple jumper wire to a uh, composite amplifier configuration. So what we're going to do here is we're going to break this and we're going to have this extended and we're going to connect it to the output here. And bingo, we've now got the buffer amplifier in our feedback loop of the MAX4239. So our output voltage here now should be determined by our input amplifier, not by this bus 634. It should eliminate any offset voltage in here by compensating with the gain of this amplifier here. So here's our feedback resistor coming from the output of the MAX4239. I'll connect that over here to the output of the buffer amplifier. No worries. And we're still probing the output of the buffer amplifier here. Look what's happened. That offset voltage that was up here, it's dropped down to zero. And we can confirm that with the multimeter over here, of course, but we don't really need to. There you go. It's zero. But let's actually go back and have a look now at the output of the MAX4239. You don't get anything. This is now not going to be zero because it has to compensate for the output voltage here because it's sensing this output voltage. So. Here's the output of the 4239. Uh, 55, minus 55 millivolts there. So it has to actually uh, change the output voltage here to compensate for the output. But this is where our line is being sensed now. So it's now compensating for that buff 634. Now there's our output signal from the buffer amplifier. And you'll notice that I've got that 47 ohm load connected here and now we're getting 1.15. So you remember before that when it was a compound amplifier, when it wasn't sensing the output, we were actually getting a drop here. But because the gain is now set by the entire composite amplifier here, driving the 47 ohm load is now accurate. It's 1.1 volts. We don't get that drop that we saw before. And I can actually change that back live. Watch this. I'll do this. Sorry. Pins bend in as a pain and uh, stick it in there and look, it's dropped to 860 millivolts. So whatever problem that we had in the output stage of this bus 634 actually driving this, whatever loss we had in there, it was being compensated for by the fact that we were using that composite circuit configuration. So once again, I'll change that back and there you go, Bob's your uncle. We're back to 1.1 volts. It's now compensating for that. Composite amplifiers. They're fantastic. They work a treat. So there you go. We are getting the advantage of this ultra low offset chopper amplifier, the MAX4239, but we're able to drive big heavy loads with it, high current loads with our buff 634 composite circuits. They're very handy. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that theoretical and practical uh, look at composite amplifiers. It's something that a lot of textbooks do not teach. But in the real world, designing real world circuits, you have to often meet unusual requirements. This is just one example. There can be lots of others um, as we've talked about. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that video and found it useful. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, discuss down below. And you can always check out the EEV blog uh, forum down below as well. And the EEV blog merch store, which keeps all this going, eevblog.store. Catch you next time.